Airbnb family, we are here in Dallas with Vera Elkins from the Short Term Rental Alliance, and we're talking about a potential ban, like a full out, you cannot Airbnb ban in Dallas. Who would have thought in the great state of Texas that a city would even ban Airbnb? But here we are. It's a very real threat. We're going to talk about how you can get involved and really what's at stake for hosts all around the greater DFW area. I'm Sean, Vera, and Sean. Let's get in. I think first, what's most important is how we got here. Airbnb has been around since, you know, just before 2010. People in Texas have been hosting a ton. I started 2014. I think you got started 2018? 2017. 2018. 2018. Um, and most hosts have been around for years. And it's only now, 2020, that there are people within communities of Dallas that are causing a great uproar and trying to push for a full-on ban. So um, let's talk a little bit of backstory. I guess, like, why are we here in Dallas where people are pushing for bans all of a sudden? Well, I think, you know, the most important thing that we need to realize is that um, there were people that were breaking rules, okay? Mm -hmm. These aren't just, <laughs> <laughs> let's not talk about that. <laughs> you have learned your lesson. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and so it, that's essentially what we're talking about is bad apples. We're not bad apples though, sorry. <laughs> we're not bad, we're not bad apples. Not everyone is. Our job as an alliance is to educate those folks and say, okay, you've got a trash issue, you've got a noise issue. Here's some solutions and let's educate you and let's fight for you. But I believe how we got here to your question is that people started complaining about the small percentage of bad apples. And we're talking minute. And that was the actual word that the city used in the city's report is that there's, there's really not a problem. Mm -hmm. So it's really people talking out neighborhoods and there's just a few people behind that. And I won't mention those names. Yeah. <laughs> can I jump in? Um, so what I, can you speak to kind of like the misnomers or what, what a lot of Airbnb hosts, they think this is all about trying to really do a hard enforcement on getting the hotel tax or the license or certifications. And that's the main focus. But after speaking to the city council people, it's more about the, the people that show up to the meetings that are really upset about their neighborhoods and noise. And so I know a lot of people that I talk to are just like, well, I'm just going to start registering. I'm just going to start paying my hotel tax and the problem will go away. But it seems like that's not the case. They're more focused on the noise. So you kind of speak to that and what we need to focus on and going forward and how we got here based on those problems, not these problems. Right. Uh, it goes back to education with the Alliance. Uh, the Alliance wants to educate those hosts of how to provide a solution. So when we go to these city council meetings, we have provided to the Horseshoe. Everybody knows what the Horseshoe is here in Dallas. And if you don't, that's city council. We have went to them numerous times with solutions to those problems that you're speaking of. There are there were numerous solutions. And the city actually already has laws for that. For these problems, um, but education on our end, and then also telling the city council, telling the neighborhood associations, this is what we can do about this. But in my personal opinion, and this is not the opinion of the alliance, but my personal opinion is they're not going to be happy until they get what they want. And I do believe what they want is a bank. I feel like people, and I'm rambling, but I feel like it's it's true. There are people that this is the this is their their project in their life right now, maybe they don't have jobs, maybe they're stay-at-home moms, and they just want, this is their, you know, alley that they're going to run in or lane that they're going to run in. Um, and some of it is just polit politics, mm -hmm. and some of it is just to get votes. Yeah. And That's my personal opinion. Also, in my opinion, so I'm not slamming people in HOAs, but there, there are people in HOAs that just complain, right? They'll complain about anything. So if there wasn't an Airbnb property on there, Block, they would complain about another neighbor doing something else. Weeds. Um, yeah. <laughs> or a truck in the front. Or leaves something. blowing into their pool well, or a branch over their fence. Like there's absolutely. people like this and they're just pointing the gun at Airbnb because it is the easiest thing to grab. It um, is. And I mean, that is, that is the case with any, any kind of problem in any kind of neighborhood or, you know, that's life, right? Mm -hmm. We see people like that all the time. If there was a college kid that lived next to them and partied every weekend, you know what? And I was the landlord. I can't just go kick them out. That neighbor is still going to live by that college kid or say, I mean, whoever it is um, that's causing the problem. But you can't just go kick them out. And what if it's a neighbor that lives there and parties all the time? 
we have these rules already in place. I think that we've provided solutions and they've kicked it to zoning because they don't want to make decisions. So with those rules, what are our rights? And I want to ask you that because I know you research this more than me. With the constitutional right and property ownership, then what, what do I have as like a right as a homeowner? I know you do rental arbitrage primarily, mm -hmm. but as far as land rights, what have you researched and especially what happened in Austin? It actually still affects arbitrage because oh, okay. um, what was pushed through the Supreme Court in Austin was that a host was told that they couldn't Airbnb their house. And bomb, bomb. The, the Supreme Court made a ruling in Austin because a homeowner wanted to Airbnb and was told they were not allowed to. And Austin ruled that a city can't make a rule telling a homeowner what they can do with their own property. If their property, so they can put it on Airbnb if they want, which includes them allowing someone else to Airbnb their property, which include a tenant. So you can have a co-host or you can have a renter do Airbnb with your permission as the homeowner. So that is something that was ruled in Austin and could have an effect here. If, thing, if push came to shove, I think people will still push their constitutional rights. It's Texas. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those are all very great points. Yeah. So you got to fight for your right to host, not party. <laughs> right. So that's how we, that's how we got to here. Right. And so what that's, that's what's happening. What's happening right now. So as far as um, what you've seen and what you've seen with these council meetings, cause I know you've been doing this for years. Yes. So what have you seen in the conversation and why is it shifted more from working with you guys and finding ways to regulate it and make it make sense to now to saying, actually, we don't want anything to do with this. How about option three? Let's focus on that and throw it to zoning and just ban it completely. How did it go from such a healthy conversation to a throw your hands up in the air, quit, and then just ban it all? Why did we get here? And why is it primarily just Dallas and not just the surrounding cities as well? That's a great question because I have spoken with numerous city council members, um, some that are in office, uh, some that are no longer in office. And most of the time, every conversation that we've had is, yes, we want to work with you. And then all of a sudden it changed. But in my personal opinion, going back to what you said, and we briefly touched on that, let's keep in mind the season that we're in. They're ramping up for campaigning and things like that. Um, neighborhood associations started getting involved and in saying, well, we represent our whole entire neighborhood. Well, that is not true. Okay. Because I know of Airbnbs in those neighborhoods <laughs> that I have friends, you know, they're friends of mine and they're good hosts and they're good apples uh, and they host very responsibly. So it's not true, but I do think that that was kind of a turning point um, because then you had neighborhood association presidents and, and things like that coming out. And that kind of shifted it. And I also think it's the political season again. Yeah. Um, I will say that prevention is probably better than cure. Maybe we're a little bit late to that. And that's how we got here. Um, a lot of hosts aren't business owners, right? They are people who find an opportunity to put their home online right. and make some money on the side. And then they, some of them were like, this is so cool. I want to do it full time. And they've made careers out of it, right. which is also cool because that's the American way. But um, the whole risk management side of the business isn't something right. a lot of people are attuned to. So very simply installing like a, 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 a ring camera on the front door, the front allows people to monitor your home, but some hosts don't have those or indoor home monitors. Um, there's minute and then there's noise aware, which are two popular ones. Mm -hmm. um, noise aware, their office is here in Dallas, which is yes. kind of fun to develop. They've got an outdoor noise monitor and then minute it's got this indoor one that's got killer features, but a lot of people don't have those. And when I've ever had issues in my Airbnbs that things went more south than they should have is because we had not yet installed our security devices to have eyes on the property. Mm -hmm. I feel like if hosts all got together to try to hold each other accountable for a good, like minimal responsible hosting standards, like keeping an eye on your home. So that way things don't get out of control. We could all go to the city and say, Hey, most of us are willing to take a responsibility for the mistakes that maybe we've made along the way as we're growing our very small businesses because the, the barrier to entry is low. But you got to give us some training wheels and we're all coming around. Here's actions we're taking and installing a noise monitor is one step. And then maybe having um, some sort of social groups where people can say, hey, there's a party going or there's a, it looks like a party is going to be underway at one of these Airbnb properties. And there's this Airbnb host group in Dallas where people will post stuff. The one happened in Houston, just the same. A guy named Robert, who um, I've been working with him, you know, just like you could call it coaching, but just kind of almost now, like just networking with the guy for like five years now, there's a party 
that was going to happen in Houston. And it wasn't about Airbnb, but it was, there was actually a pop-up party that they call them viral parties where uh-huh. they go on social media. Hey, go, come here in about six hours. They lost their venue. And then they're looking for venues to go. Oh, shoot. Wow. And so their last minute thing was, well, let's just book a house in the middle of nowhere. This happened to be one of Robert's houses. And because he's involved in all these little networks, somebody saw a social media post, took a screenshot, sent it to him. He had a cop there before people even showed up. Good and <laughs> the internet, the whole little 20-year-old, 25-year-old internet was furious that the party got canceled. They were mad at the club promoter, right? They weren't mad at the Airbnb host. They were right. mad at the club promoter because right. the Airbnb host just did their job. Right. And now that club promoter is getting sued for that whole thing. It's wow. like their own mini Houston Fire Festival. But good prevention is, is probably the, the best thing we can he do. He dodged a bullet right there. That was, yes. a, that was a big I, one. 3,000 people. 3,000 people? Oh, my God. That is an excellent story. And I tell but city council members ask us all the time, you know, well, what, what kind of – you talk about being a responsible host. What does that look like? Well, for us, uh, we have a few in my hometown, which I have family there. Uh, and that's in Augusta, Georgia. But here, I live around them. Even before parties start – we are there because most of the time I've been hosting long enough where I can see, oh, this is, this is someone that potentially may want to party. And at that point we let them know and we make it, we make them aware as a host and we will show up and we will, you know, intervene if we need to. The one party I showed up to had just got started. Literally people were still showing up and I was like, see you guys. Nope. Bye, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> and never even, it never even kicked off. Mm-hmm. And so, um, we, we do, we show up, we're, we're more engaged. Um, and we can be because literally they're five minutes away. We do host that way, kind of preventative because it is, it's being proactive versus reactive. It's always better to be proactive mm-hmm. um, versus reactive. So I loved your, I loved your uh, quote that you did at the beginning of this, uh, right when you went into this, still way into that, it was good. Yeah, I, uh, I think that the, and also people don't need to be scared from going to our Airbnbs. If you want to have a birthday party and there's 10 or 12 people and you keep the music down, that's fine. Or if you have a baby shower or if you need to have like your business associates or someone over for like a dinner, that's fine. But this whole, like you were going to be so hard at crackdown that there's nothing that's going to ever fun be happening at any of your Airbnbs. Right. That's not the way we should go. It's the minute systems. It's the noise awares. It's the, it's just the, okay, have a good time, but just do it responsibly. And, um, <clears throat> and I just, I think so far people have been so aggressive about just nothing at all can happen and then we'll all be fine. I don't think that's necessarily the most healthy way to go forward. And it's not even Airbnb anymore now, right? Because Airbnb has a, like permanized their made permanent, their party guy, right? Right. But now there's other platforms like my house here is on Pure Space, uh-huh. and I will let 40 people into my home for a dinner party here because they want the view and they set up their own tables and they have right. catering. People who are going to party now, like official parties, get booked on other avenues, not on Airbnb. Right. It's true. So people will book, hey, I'm, I'm doing a wedding shower or I'm doing a reception. I want 100 people at this place and they can book on Pure Space. It's not going to be Airbnb. Right. So neighbors who are going to be mad about actual, you know, um, allowed congregations are that they're, they can't attack the short term rental market to stop it. They're going to have to do something else. And the, the unauthorized party, um, situation that Airbnb, Airbnb went through during COVID is really a thing of the past now too. It really spiked right after COVID and people were told to quarantine, especially in Philadelphia where I've got some property, they shut down all the bars. So what happened naturally people booked houses for parties. Absolutely. And it was more of a problem with how the city managed their shutdowns. Mm-hmm. And so Airbnb's got like this overflow of activity, but now that has settled down because people can go back to their normal lives again. Yes, and I've, I've explained that to city council, um, several members, several times. I said, look, I said, during COVID, people didn't have any place to go. Now we hosted a lot of people that were like, you know what? I'm coming in to see my family. They're a little bit more covid than we are, and they have, you know, circumstances that they need to be. So can we stay at your place and we're just going to have them over? Mm-hmm. And, um, but yes, it did kind of it cause a problem, but we are beyond that. We did learn from that, but it goes back to, I, I, I agree, how the city managed that. And Airbnbs, I think, were a vital part of the city's handling of COVID also. Absolutely. If we didn't have all the homes available for people to come in, for traveling nurses to have their own safe space... The cities all over the country would have had a much harder time. So, absolutely, I tell, and I we, as a whole, we have mentioned that to city council members. It seems that 
be so quickly out of their memories mm -hmm. that yes, we hosted essential workers. We kept working, hosts did. Mm -hmm. Most hosts kept working during the pandemic because I had grocery store workers staying at our Airbnbs oh, wow. because they did not, maybe they took care of grandma and I can relate. Okay. I can relate. <laughs> um, but the problem is, is we've forgotten about that. What about the winter storm guys? Mm -hmm. I had to pull in all of our staff and, and we're a small staff and I had to pull them all in. And I said, I have never gotten this many messages. I cannot keep up with these people are desperate. They have nowhere to go. Do you have electricity? Do you have water? Yeah. I have the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were getting a hundred messages an hour. Oh, wow. Eight hours. Wow. Wow. So yes. wow. Um, and unfortunately we, we did. And then one of our properties did not have electricity. People were like, I don't care. I need a place to sleep. My flights are canceled. My hotels are booked. There's, I don't have a car. This is the closest place. I said, that's fine. They're in shelter. We have, you know, we have hot water and all that. Um, because it was going in and out because, you know, we had the waves. Mm -hmm. And so I said, right now, this moment, this hour, we don't have electricity, but it's probably going to be turned back on. It's been coming in waves. They didn't care. They needed a place to stay, to, you know, just to rest for a few hours. So, yeah. And so to your point there, there are times where having the ability to host, the city needs to be prepared like that. Like when Hurricane Ike, or no, it was Harvey, hit Houston, mm -hmm. there's, there's laws in Texas that you cannot practice mold remediation. And I only know this because I'm mold and water certified. I've doing, been doing it since I was 16. But I'm not in the state of Texas. And the rules to get mold certified, to get a license in Texas, is just astronomically difficult. You can't study and then get a license without spending. You have to have a graduate degree and some other weird stuff. But when Harvey hit, they didn't have enough people to like rip out all the walls and all the mold from these homes. So they wiped that and made a temporary like, reprieve of the requirements of licensing to do mold remediation in Houston only because they hit like a, a genuine disaster and their regulations no longer serve the people. Right. So now in what seems to be a normal scenario, like, oh, let's make some Airbnb regulations. Oh, that might sound well and good, but then what happens when you have a ton of people that need to relocate to Dallas because of some reason, right? Like when Katrina hit and everybody came from New Orleans to Houston, imagine if we had Airbnb, but then Houston banned it, and then you have 100,000 people flooding in, and then they take the stadium and try to push temporary shelter in the stadium, but there's not enough room. You know, things like that could genuinely happen. So I think because of like the, the era that we live in with nomadic culture, work remote, people are traveling, Absolutely. canceling their leases, not buying homes and just traveling and living places. Mm -hmm. I think cities that are well prepared to house people temporarily will do the best job of like having a good, solid global reputation. Mm -hmm. And so it's in a way, it's not even tourism, right? Because people are coming here to work, but they're like, I'm going to go to Dallas for a couple months. Mm -hmm. It's the short term rental market that can take in that overflow and give people real lives instead of them being stuck in the W or something. You know, I think it's a, it's an important, um, it's a, an important feature for a modern city right. to have some Absolutely. form of work for Absolutely. Um, so in my, in my video before this, I just posted yesterday, uh, I asked people to ask me questions. And one of those questions is, and this weird idea is that it's okay. I paid my hotel taxes and I'm going to be grandfathered in. So I'm safe. No matter what happens, I'm good. Why is that not necessarily accurate and why even if you feel like you're safe, you should still get involved and you should still come to the ZOAC meeting and you should still even register to speak on the 7th? Absolutely. Um, that's a great question because I think that that's in all of our minds that are paying hotel tax. Um, at one point, if you look at past meetings with city council, that was brought up. There are several city council members that said, hey, look, there is a legal precedence for grandfathering in. Um, now, if you notice... When people bring that up, city council really isn't even mentioning it. Um, look, they asked us to give them proposed, re like, give us regulations that you would like to see happen. Do you know how many times they asked us to do that and how many times that we drafted those up? Like, it's insane. And, and nothing was ever taken in. Grandfathering was always in, um, in, in our proposal. Because there is a legal precedent. Um, so, but the last couple of meetings, it just doesn't seem to be mentioned by city council anymore. Um, I don't know why that is other than I think they're scared that people will just go out and register and pay for them sometimes. I do think that people need to show up. I think that people need to, um, show up to the seventh, which is what, next Thursday mm -hmm. or this Thursday, excuse me. And we need to be speaking. We need to sign up in the sign up deadline 
is tomorrow by 5 p.m. We probably won't have this video out until tomorrow. Uh, right. and I will so, do my best to edit this together as fast as humanly possible. Okay. We will find out Jeez. today. <laughs> can this man do it? And then I would have to do I'm the sure hypercut. <laughs> oh my God. It's July 4th and we're going to be doing all this on July yeah. 4th. Who knows? We might be, I might be able to make it work. I'll just make Jack's drive as I go down to Austin. And yeah. I'll just blow my side. Thing. I'll be watching fireworks while editing as well. <laughs> yeah. That, and that's, that's us all as entrepreneurs. We work all the time. And further about the hotel tax and why sure. it may not be enough is... You've got two <laughs> polarized sides, yes. both that are anti air movie. You've got the Maggie neighbor, neighborhood people, mm -hmm. right? And then you've got the hotels. And hotels have lobbyists that are always trying to push short term rentals out of any city mm -hmm. because it takes money off of their plate. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure a hotel would gladly write a fat check to some politician if they decide to. You know, kind of like forget that people are paying their hotel taxes. The hotel's like, we'll, 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 we'll like write you some extra money just so you forget about the hotel taxes you could make from that. Mm -hmm. We want to be the only people making revenue here. Yeah. So that's a game. Too. One of the things that I was in, I was in Myrtle Beach a couple of weeks ago and I spoke with a retired, you know, short term rentals. They're not a new thing, they've always been around. Mm -hmm. um, and so she'd been in the industry and the hotel industry for quite some time. Um, and is retired, and so she was asking me about you know what I do, and da, 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 da. and this all came up. And she said, "This was the suggestion she made. I'm not telling uh, you know people to do this, but it is. It, it was a good suggestion." She said, "When you go to these meetings, if you're paying your hotel tax, bring that record with you, or have a letter from your CPA or something, and say, here's what I'm paying to the city of Dallas, and here is the letter that you asked us to register. So we keep talking about a registration system, really." There is already one in place. Let's not forget that. Mm -hmm. um, just because we quote, uh, you know, a definition in a code and then we refer to the tax law, well, that is your definition and it is in your code. Just because you refer out, that doesn't matter. You refer to it in your code. It's not just a tax code that we're talking about. That was the registration system that we have. That's what we currently have. So... They asked us to register. They told us we had to register to be legal. This is a public announcement that's online. You can go find it, or you probably have a letter if you've kept it. Bring that to the meeting and bring a letter from your CPA or from your you know, legal staff or whatever and say, hey, this is what you asked me to do. I'm registered. Here's the money I paid. I did what you said. You've taken my money. Why? Why? So, be, and that's my take on the grandfathering and mm -hmm. of actions that needs to be done from a host. Um, I have a lot, a lot of people have been asking me, should we just jump on the jump, jump in front of the train and just do all the registration and the hotel tax because we haven't done it so far. Would that make any difference at this point? What if, what if we fail? And then we later on try to litigate grandfathering in, and then now we show records that we were paying hotel, even if it was only for like two or three months or, or five months. Okay. Does it even matter to register or do hotel taxes this time? Or is it a little bit too late? I think, uh, I think that that is one, um, I was going to say something there. I was going to really bad. I think that that <laughs> is one good strategy. Uh, to have, I don't think that uh, I don't think that it's a lost cause. I think that it's a fighting, a way to fight. It's a way to say I am a responsible uh, host. I'm a responsible business owner. This is what I'm doing. Even if they, you know, even if they've only paid, you know, and they're just now going to start paying. Okay, well, by all means, because look, not everybody got a letter. It goes back to the city can't even, you know enforce really the registration system that they already have. Mm -hmm. um, but they do have it in place. I got a letter. Oh, I get letters all the time. <laughs> so I do think, I, I, I won't say that that's a lost cause. I think that that's a way to fight grandfather. Yeah. So the city would do best to make a strategic decision to create some form of middle ground regulation that they can manage, right? Mm -hmm. Because if they do push this too far and say no one in any residential areas can have an Airbnb, that will just encourage disobedience because when you look at the law of large numbers, there will be people who decide to say, well, I'm already running good. Yeah. Take my guns, right? Yeah. That whole thing. Come and take it. So, um, and, and in that case, then they'll have even more work to do from people who are no longer cooperative. Right. But, and so it's better to use a carrot than a stick in this case. Um, I think our voice as a collective of hosts in, in Dallas is to appeal to common sense to the, the council members that, hey, you can do something that people will cooperate with and gladly follow along, or you could do something stupid 
that now you are all of a sudden public enemy number one in the short-term rental space, and it's not going to go away because you banned it. Right. Now you're just going to get a lack of cooperation. So that's a very good segue into another large question is, what is the difference between option one, two, and three? And why is one and two something that could be a soft, soft ban and like a potential way we can work around and work with the city, whereas option three is pretty much just like a, right. just burn, burn the, burn the, Burn the trenches, burn the <laughs> farms. Well, burn, What's it burn, uh, you can burn the I'll burn all the bridges. I mean, like burn, burn the, the bridges. I mean, What's it? Burn the bridges. Burn the land. Uh, What's the quote? So, <laughs> <laughs> a burn well, ban. <laughs> well, whatever the Romans did. Yeah, when they scorched well, earth. Yeah. Got it. So I mean scorched there's earth. things being thrown out and, and you know, you could look at the, the three options, but then that really all, all of those are significantly a, a ban, okay? Because even within those, there's a, the 1500 uh, foot rule, and then you've got uh, that you know you can only have so so many. And there's so many things that are being talked about um, that it's like it is confusing. So I understand those questions. It goes back to because even within those regulations, there are things that would essentially ban some short term rentals. So there's what we want to do is like what you talked about. Very, very sensible, common sense, reasonable, and not overly restrictive regulations. Um, so we can we can look at either all of those, but we want the bare minimum. And uh, the last time I looked, I think that's option B. But mm -hmm. let me just tell you that option B, A, B, and C, and D have all changed at one point in time. Um, if that makes any sense. Because look, I have... I have read over so many proposed regulations. Like, it makes me wonder, like, what are my tax dollars going towards? Because we've been fighting over this, and we've been, I mean, so what, somebody's back in their office down at City Hall coming up with this? this that takes work. Mm -hmm. and our tax dollars are paying for just somebody. Yeah. Just sit around all day. <laughs> Another reason to defend residential Airbnbs or short-term rentals is because as home prices get higher and higher, people get pushed out because they can't afford their taxes mm -hmm. and can't afford their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. the city, the, remember the island of Korchula we went to in Italy, mm -hmm. right? Or in Croatia, sorry, Croatia. The people who lived in Korchula, their properties got crazier and crazier, and they would have either been forced to sell to some foreign investor, like an Italian investor in Croatia, or they put their own home on the short-term rental market, and they were able to keep their fourth-generation home, mm -hmm. right? So when you look at gentrifying communities, you're like, oh, this is so bad because people are pushing in and turning them into Airbnbs. Well, actually, what that is is showing the locals what they can do with their own home to be able to keep their property and not have to sell it to BlackRock one day. Right. So if we banned Airbnbs and everybody started selling properties and we started to push the market down into the ground, then what we would do is we'd be unloading properties probably to an investment portfolio. There'd be people who have the liquidity to buy up a neighborhood and they don't care about Dallas because there's some nationwide fund and we'd be handing our properties to people who are not DFW. So to, to answer your question, I mean, because there's going to be a lot of options and then at this next meeting and the next city council meeting, those options are going to change. What people need to know is, is that you need to read any kind of option that is put out. What we want is an option that is, that, that, because even with, in, you have to look into the details of, even if it's very soft regulations, as you use that word, and I like that. Um, you have to look at the details of that because as an alliance, it's our job to represent all of short-term rentals. But even some of those soft regulations are kind of, would put a ban on some short-term rentals. Um, and if they're good apples, we don't want to do that. So we can look at these options all day long, um, and they're going, essentially, if, if we continue to do what we've been doing, city council meeting, if they continue to just pass the ball and pass the ball, those options are going to change, and they're going to look different. Um, so, But what we do need is we need very reasonable short-term rental regulations that will not ban any short-term rentals, so not, you know, single family, not multifamily, various things, um, definitely doesn't need to go to zoning, um, because potentially all of those really will put some sort of ban on, on some type of short-term rental. I, I know you don't work for the city, but say for instance, mm -hmm. we lose, and it, it's a full ban, 
and then the city says, hey, we need to we need to start regulating this. And everyone starts trying to sell their house or put, on, put it on um, rentals. The housing market gets screwed up. The rental market gets screwed up. But then the Airbnb uh, owners that don't decide to participate, they just keep running their business. Do you know, um, in your own personal opinion, do you know what the repercussions might be of something, of someone in those situations that just say, I don't want to sell. I don't want to turn it into long-term rental. I just want to play the risk and keep going. Have you heard of anything? There, so there have been a lot of things that have been talked about. Look, if you've ever been in these all day city council meetings, it's like, it's like, we're going to talk about the same thing and beat the hell out of something and then not come up with a solution. Okay. Um, a lot of things were tossed around, but essentially it's hefty fines. Um, and, and they accumulate. So it's not just one fine, but they're going to accumulate. Uh, and so that, the accumulation of those fines is what's the scary thing, right? If it was just one fee, well, you know, that wouldn't seem heavy enough as what they were basically saying. So that's what's been tossed around. But if you don't pay those fines? Right. Like, what happens? I'm, I'm sure that there's a process. It's just like the same thing. I, I live in a historical district with my personal home. <laughs> uh, with my personal home. So if I, you know, break certain code violations then eventually they do turn into fines and then i think the the city attorney, like i think the district attorney gets involved or something like that i'm not i'm not a lawyer yeah no it's <laughs> you're not supposed to be the expert on this question okay. i just i wanted to ask if you yeah. heard anything so the, yeah. it basically fines and then they would accumulate mm -hmm. so and every city has their stance on enforcement of fines like for example dade county like miami they screwed that up they could put a fine on you and say you owe 20 grand for Airbnb in your property, but there's no way for them to levy against you. There's no way to enforce the fine. They could put they could put it on your credit score. They couldn't take any of your property. They can try to forcefully collect. They can prevent you from doing anything. And that was it. But in Nashville, they gave a man a fine. The guy didn't pay his fine. And they he spent a day in jail eventually for just ignoring everything. So um, city to city, it will change. I'll do a day in jail just to keep my Airbnb property. I mean, you should do a day in jail just to stay humble. Yeah, you know, keep, yeah. Your, keep your ego down. <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to go that route. <laughs> you get free sandwiches. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, we could like to make this trend with hashtag a day in jail. Could be a, a day in jail. Could be a whole thing. So we, we talked about where, where, we go, where we were, where we are, what yes. could happen. And lastly, I want to talk about how, what is, what we're asking of people, like what meetings, why is it important? What's coming up after July 7th? Like what, what is your Facebook group? How can they contact you? What's, what's going on? And so how do we go forward? Well, thank you. Cause that is the most important question. <laughs> so, um, on the 7th, which is Thursday, uh, please show up at the ZOAC meeting. You can, uh, will you put a link of the Dallas Alliance? Um, so sure. they can go, uh, anyone can go to this website and get all the details. The most important thing for people to know is to sign up to this meeting on Thursday. You need to sign up by tomorrow. Okay. Or today, by depending. Five PM. <laughs> <laughs> or today. So Tuesday, July 5th, 5 p.m. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then if you will continue to look onto our website, the Alliance website, uh, and if you sign up, we will send out emails. We are, we are communicating with people. Airbnb is communicating with people on every meeting. We need we don't need people just to show up to the seven. And sometimes the city will do a briefing and let you know three days in advance. Um, we need people to to sign up and show up at every meeting possible. It is serious, and if they don't hear from us, they're going to hear for every one you know just one pro they've got three antis and that is their personal agenda to get as many the people show up uh that they can and they've been they've been effective in the past now thanks to you thanks to you hopefully we'll get the word out 100 percent. how how, sh how should they be prepared um show up all suit and ties or show up casual like a normal everyday guy or girl um, show up with a professional speech written or just go off the heart? What should they even talk about? What are, is it going to be five hours of just sitting there bored as hell or is it going to be interactive? Just for those people that are sitting at home right now and they've, they've never been to something like this before and they're nervous to show up, what should they expect? Well, I think that you should come, uh, you know, business casual. Uh, and number, number one, you always want to be respectful. They are our leaders, whether we agree with them or not. Um, and, and being respectful uh, shows... Uh, represents the alliance well and it represents host well um in the aspect of what they should bring up um and talk about 
Well, I think that they should be prepared. Um, the last meeting, I was not prepared because the city sent out wrong information. I had to speed home to get to my computer to do it because I was going to do it via phone. Um, and I was not prepared because I spent you know so much time trying to get to the meeting. That being said, um, I think it's very important. Just have it three topics of why you're doing it, like your hosting, and what's your personal story, uh, because that goes a long ways. Um, for me, it's because I, I take care of my grandmother, so it's it's huge. That's how I got into it. Um, also, that you're a responsible host, um, and that this would this would devastate you. And also about your, uh, I would for people that are paying their hotel tax, I would definitely bring the public notice or the letter you got. If you don't have that public notice, go online. It's there. It's a public notice. Get it because a public notice means all of us and anybody that lives in here uh, in in Dallas. That was your public notice. So bring that, bring, you know, say, hey, I've registered, et cetera, et cetera, because then it's showing that you're a responsible host. The people showing up, they're tallying, tallying these numbers at the end of every meeting. To your next question, whether it's going to be five hours, three hours, or all day, well, if people will sign up as soon as they get these emails from the Alliance, so go to our website, sign up to get these emails, sign up to be members if you're a host, or even if you're just a friend of a host, or if you're a cleaner, a house cleaner, or a maintenance person, whatever, because it, it takes, I mean, it takes all of us showing up, okay? So if you'll get our emails, we're going to tell you specifically what to do. We're also going to give you talking points. Um, and so we kind of lay it out to where the people at home that are nervous they don't have to be because everything is in that email. We also post stuff on Twitter and on uh, Facebook. In the aspect of if it's going to be all day, sign up quickly. Sign up as soon as you can. That way it's first come, first serve when it comes to signing up. Uh, and just don't give up. I have sat in the meeting literally for eight hours <laughs> and then spoke. Um, I, a lot of people don't have that time. A lot of people, you know, that's this is not their, you know, they work nine to five. I suggest doing a, um, do it over phone or do it over Zoom, but you can also do it in person. Um, so it's, it's up to the individual, but we make it very easy. The Alliance makes it very easy and we prepare people the best way we can. Yeah. And in Detroit, when uh, they banned and they fixed it, mm -hmm. um, they get their ban repealed. The people that really drove that home were the workers, like the housekeepers and stuff like right. that. So that having a story like, I rely on the short-term rental market for my for my livelihood. It gives me the kind of job that I need to live my life, X, Y, Z. Or more people who were in financial hardship and were able to survive financial hardship with their first property or right. maybe their first and second because new family properties or whatever. It's the little people's stories. It absolutely really is. And I, I just want to say, like, I tell people all the time, especially when I speak to city council members, I'm like, we voted you in, but I just want to let you know why it's so important to us. It's not just about me putting food on my table and for my family. And it's not just about me taking care of my grandmother, but I have a staff. I have a small staff. They're not, I don't have a big staff. They're very small, but they put food on their table. You know, so-and-so just had a new one, you know, things like that. Um, and it is very true. If so it's, it's more than just about the host. It's about the community. And we're, I'm talking like, what are we going to do if it does get a bit? Like, is city council okay with sending that many people home without jobs? That's my question. Can you sleep at night? And I've asked them that. I don't get a response, but I've asked them, can you sleep at night knowing that you're taking food off of people's table mm -hmm. if you put a ban? I don't have an answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, but that's what matters, really. It's a pretty rough rhetorical question. Yeah. You just let that sit there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they respond, yes, I'm fully okay yeah. with going to sleep at yeah. night. <laughs> we were prepared for 10,000 lost jobs. On yeah. This <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That'd be trash. I think that covers most of my questions. Do you have anything? Um, that, do I have anything? Um, aside from making sure that people understand that, um, that it's the little people, the little voices that will really probably win this and appealing to the city's like, logic that something cooperative is going to work and something like a ban isn't because you're just going to get renegades. Like, stuff like that, I think, was the biggest thing. There will be links in the description of this video for everything you need from the Short-Term Model Alliance. Thank you. Um, there probably will eventually be some form of fundraiser to get an attorney if it comes to that. Yes, so, yes, sir. Yep, we're going to have that. Um, other resources that might be necessary will be in the link of this video. And then, of course, Sean Ray here will have a faster recap 
um, of this as well. Um, and maybe even some fresh ideas after sitting on this for a couple hours. So um, check out Sean Ray's YouTube channel because he's also a Dallas host and cares a lot about this. So um, all my friends here in Dallas, I'm rooting for you guys. Um, it's going to affect all of us no matter what band they try to put. So we really need to find a way to make this um, as free as possible. You know, keep Texas free. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you guys for watching this video. As always, we'll see you on the other side. See you July 7th.